Okay, welcome. Uh, I've met most of you already in the workshops, so thank you for coming to the lectures. I am Dr. Wesley Burr. I am a member of the math department. I am the coordinator of this course. We have two sections, section A, that's you, and section B, comprising about 575 people, somewhere in that ballpark. It's a big class. And for reasons not really clear to me, we are in rooms that don't quite fit us. So we're trying to fix that for next year. Apparently, it's something about more students, and we weren't expecting it to be quite this big. So they put us in here, and then there were more than we expected. So that's life. So uh, as you've seen in the workshops, this is a very technical course. We have a lot of things going on, a lot of different little things that you have to do. Uh, I deliberately set it up, though, to try and break it up so that your grades get pieced out to you a little bit at a time. So if you have a bad week or you have a bad Friday, it doesn't cost you 20% of your score. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I lost my... Is this your laptop? Yes. Okay. Thank there you. Go. you. So weekly quizzes, weekly assignments. Downside to that is they're online. They're done on web work. We cannot get enough resources from the university or in any sort of reasonable world to mark 600 assignments per week or 600 courses per week. It just isn't happening. So that's what technology is for. So you get the advantage of the constant reinforcement and learning and the little, little bits of marks, and I get the advantage of not dying due to overwork. So that trade-off seems like a pretty good one to me. So that's web work. And then as you've seen, we have Slack, and we're going to be doing stuff in R, and you can treat R just like a giant calculator, and that's fine as we get through the semester and into next winter, as if you continue in 1052. The skills keep growing, and especially for those of you in the sciences, doing labs, R is more and more being used as the environment in which you will type and create your lab reports and to do scientific analysis especially if you want to become a professional practicing scientist in the real world, get a job, do this type of stuff day to day. It's a valuable skill. It's like learning Excel, but a lot more powerful. So let's get started. Lecture 00, this is just coursework administration, just kind of an introduction. So this is my name, my office, my email, my contact on Slack. My preference is that you ping me on Slack, not on email unless it's something personal, private, that needs a data trip. If it's something like, I'm going to be out of the country because of reason X, and I need you to know this, and this is the formal documentation, email. If it's, am I in this lecture hall today, Slack. Don't ask questions that are really quick and not really personal or private on email. It's a waste of my time. It's a waste of your time. Ask it once, and everybody gets the answer. If you absolutely need to get in touch with me, that's my phone extension. Uh, and you can probably leave me a message because I'm not actually around the phone all that often. We have a lot of workshops. I don't know if you've noticed. You have been assigned to a workshop. They are mandatory. Missing them is not the sensible option. You can, and then you take the hit on the percentage from that quiz, and you take the hit on not learning that material, and you start falling behind. Skip the lecture by all means. Don't skip the workshops. They're your priority. You must go to your assigned workshop, as you've all seen, except for the one section that hasn't gone yet on Wednesday. They're full. You don't have a lot of room for you just picking one at random. You go to your assigned workshop. We did our best to set it up so that every single program at Trent had at least one slot where the students could come and not have a conflict with everything else that they do. So respect that and go to your section. The Wi-Fi and DNA is flaky, so please get your system working on Edgerome. If you weren't able to do it so far, you've got until your next workshop to get it up and running. Syllabus has been posted. You can download it and check it. Read it carefully. There's, okay. uh, there's all the details about this. 20% of your final score is your quizzes. 20% of your final score is your weekly assignments. The lowest of each is dropped. I would strongly recommend you not rely on that too early. Don't just be like, oh, I'm going to take a break this weekend or head to the Trent or something. Leave it for like week 11 when you really just need a break because exams are coming. And then you can just skip one and not hand it in. And it's totally fine because the lowest ones drop. There will be a lab exam in the last couple weeks of class in your workshop time testing your ability to use R. You're learning how to use R, and we're going to teach you how to do tasks in R. And in the lab exam, we'll be asking you to do a small list of things of an hour and a half on your own with just you and your computer in the workshops to do something. 
and that'll be worth 15% of your score. And then the final written exam will be done in the exam break. We don't know the schedule yet until it's set, um, and it'll be worth 45% of your score. So that's the course. There's the course policies from the syllabus. Uh, if you send me an email from something that's not at Trent U, I just delete it. I have no idea who you are. If you use that Trent U, then I know I have a contact and I have a username and I know what student you are. You send me an email from sexykitty32, I have no <laughs> idea who that is. You can say you're a student, but I don't know who you are and I can't respond to it. So send me emails from Trent if you must send me emails at all. Uh, workshops, what they are, the web work system. I cannot and will not give you extensions on the assignments because it's a digital thing where I set a due date for the entire class. If I give you an extension, I give everyone an extension. So unless there's something very strange where the whole class gets an extension, I'm not making an exception for you. Again, 600 people, you are not that special. <laughs> you are totally allowed to talk to each other about assignments, but obviously you click the buttons yourself, you put in your own answers. But we do encourage collaboration, and that's part of the reason you have multiple attempts. If you try it a couple times and you're not getting it, don't just guess seven times and then throw your hands up in the air and walk away. Come ask a TA. Ask me, ask a friend, figure it out. That's the point. There are no makeup quizzes, again, because the technology doesn't really allow for it unless there are exceptional cases. If you have something go wrong that's not a medical emergency, your worst quiz gets dropped. There you go, you just used it, that's your mulligan. And you can't have makeup exams unless you really are in the hospital, and in which case you're going through student accessibility services, you're getting it documented, and they're dealing with the fact that you missed your exam, not directly with me. All right, all the sites, again, I put all this up on Pirate for you. And the bonus marks and the announcement officially that it will be worth up to a maximum of 2% of your final grade for eight mini modules completed. So if you complete eight of those modules, and I can see an eight next to your name on data camp, plus two, final grade. Any number between zero and eight gets you that many 0.25 points. Can you get over 100 then? No, the, you will get exactly 100. So theoretically, if you got 99.1 in the course and plus two, you'd get exactly 100. There is no support for greater than 100% in a course. You can get greater than 100% on an assignment or something like that, and that happens all the time at Trent. But your final grade is capped at perfect, as you might imagine. Uh, and already we have some people who've already completed some of these modules because they had some free time this weekend and they just got it out of the way. So this person here, uh, the first one with the three, already received 0.75 bonus points on his final mark. And this girl here received 0.5, and so on. So if you have the time, I strongly encourage you to play around with that. All right, lecture number one. This is where we start. The theory. Statistics. What is it? Why are you here? Why do your scientific disciplines think that this is important for you? Because after all, most of your first years, you don't know what you should be learning from a hole in the ground. You're just here to learn, and you are trusting people with PhDs and 20 years experience to tell you this is the important stuff. That's what school is, after all. Statistics is old. It's a very old discipline, not as old as mathematics, but in, in a lot of ways it's as old as all of the modern sciences, chemistry and physics and astronomy. This is a quote from Florence Nightingale. How many people have heard of Florence Nightingale? Most of you. She was a British nurse during the Crimean War and was responsible for going to Parliament and yelling at them until they agreed to fix medical practices at the time, which consisted of a lot of people with wounds and infections lying in mud. As you can imagine, it didn't work so well, a lot of deaths, and she was influential in the creation of modern nursing. She's the patron saint, essentially, of modern nursing. And this is a quote about the death of a man named Quetelet, who was a Belgian astronomer and mathematician, and who was responsible for the introduction of statistical methods to the social sciences, which at the time included medicine. So he was indirectly responsible for her, and she was directly responsible for the formation of modern nursing. Hal Varian is the chief economist, or at least at the time was, of Google, also Alphabet now. And this is an interview of him from 2009, and I keep saying the, next, the sexy job in the next 10 years will be statisticians, and he's not wrong. Data science has exploded in the last four years, and every company wants data scientists, 
Data scientist is a modern sexy name for statistician. It's what we're teaching you to do. It is the analysis of data. And that leads us to our definition. Statistics is the science of collecting, organizing, summarizing, and analyzing data for the purposes of answering questions and drawing conclusions about the universe. That could be said that that is the definition of science. But statistics is specifically concerned with dealing with the data points, the gathering and the, and the analyzing of data points, field agnostic. Whereas in physics, you're concerned with a very narrow view of the world. You look at just the physical phenomena and what classifies as physics. And in chemistry, you're concerned primarily with chemical reactions, although obviously subatomic chemistry is essentially physics. And biology is concerned with living things, which can span the gamut all the way from bacteria and viruses, all the way up to blue whales and entire ecosystems, which leads us into environmental science, and so on and so on. They are all concerned with trying to figure out how the universe works. And they are all drowning in data. Doesn't matter what field you're in, data drives modern science. We have created more information as a human race in the last 10 minutes than existed before 1950. That is the rate at which we are starting to gather data. How many of you do not We'll do the negative. Own a smartphone. Yeah, it's a solid one. Thank you. One whole person in an entire class who doesn't own a smartphone, and she's brave for admitting it. That smartphone is constantly gathering data about you. Constantly. Your position, what you're doing, what packets are flying back and forth between you and the phone, what Facebook you just looked at, what accounts you're in. It's all there, and it's all being saved, and it will probably never be deleted. And it will exist as long as humans exist. We're starting to save everything. We're drowning in data, and this is absolutely true in science as well. We have too much data, we don't know what to do with it all. And that's what statistics is all about. So, they're just observations. Generally, they're observations. Often for the purposes of conclusion, sometimes just because somebody thought it was interesting to gather it. And we have, we'll see some of those. But they always require context. If I say 15, 18 and a half, 18.9 and 24, what does that mean? What is those data points? What are they? I have no idea. You have no idea. There's no context. Those could be birth weights of swallows in grams. They could be the number of pizzas eaten per dorm at Trent last weekend. <laughs> they could be anything. We don't know unless we have context. And it is important, and I'm just sort of giving you this now because you won't do this right now, but at some point in your career, you will start gathering data. And that data will mean very specific things to you. If you were hit by a bus and the person next to you had to look at that, would they be able to understand it? When you are gathering and storing data, you should always be expecting that yes, you will indeed be hit by a bus and that you want to leave a legacy of data that's understandable. That's what's called metadata, and it's the context attached to the data that tells you what it is, where it was gathered, how it was gathered, and what it means. It's not 15, 18 and a half, which means nothing without context. Even if I added units there, that is not enough for you to understand the context. All right, and this is where we get started. So that's the, the background and the overview of the course. This is chapter 1.1 in the text. By the end of the second lecture, we'll be done the first chapter, essentially. We move through it quite quickly. It will be overwhelming. It is definition land. It is the common language that we will be using for the rest of the year. And so we have a lot of definitions and a lot of things where we just need to introduce it for the first time and let you know what the word means, and then we'll use it repeatedly through the semester. But we're gonna start with a case study. So, chronic fatigue. Some of you who have sort of medical backgrounds or have family members who suffer from this may be familiar with chronic fatigue syndrome. It's kind of one of these things we don't really understand. We don't know where it comes from. We don't know the physiological drivers of chronic fatigue. We just know it exists. We try and treat it, and we're trying to learn more about it. So the objective of this study, which was published in 1997 in the American Journal of Psychiatry, is to evaluate the effectiveness 
of a cognitive behavior therapy on sufferers of chronic fatigue. So cognitive therapy is messing with your head, trying to talk you out of your chronic fatigue. And I mean, it's in psychiatry, so a huge surprise there. That is the objective of their entire field, is to talk you out of your neuroses. The participant pool was 142 patients who were referred from their local physicians, primary care, and consultants who specialized in chronic fatigue and were sent to these scientists and asked to participate in the study. Of the 142, only 60 actually entered the study. This is totally normal. People refuse, people disappear. People are really unreliable subjects. Mice are much better. They don't run away on you so much. Some of them were excluded, some of them chose not to do it, had other health issues, and some were just weren't interested in being part of the study, and that's totally fine. Of these 60, they randomly assigned them with the flip of a coin to either a treatment group or a control group. And in the treatment group, they were given a shrink, and they were talked at, and they were given collaborative education therapy on how to increase their activity slowly without triggering whatever their chronic fatigue symptoms actually were. And the other 30 were just taught how to do yoga and relax and just take it easy and maybe you're just stressing yourself out. That's the context of the study. This is the distribution of the patients and unfortunately PDF screwed up my table, but you can still read it a little bit. Um, so, did the patients result in a good outcome, which is to say increased activity, reduced symptoms of their chronic fatigue? So in the treatment group, 19 out of 27 people who completed the study saw an improvement. And eight did not. Three of the patients in that group dropped out of the study due to one reason or another before the study completed. And so they were removed from the system. Of the control group, we were taught to sit and say, um, those people, five saw an improvement, 21 did not, and four had dropped. So to just kind of quickly summarize those, we say, what percentage saw an improvement? Just to kind of quickly compare the two groups, 70% of the treatment group and 19% in the control. Is that a a good result? Is that a real result? And statistics is really studying how certain we are about results like this. So we see 70% and 19%. And if you had the choice between having something good happen to you with a 70% chance, that's better than a 19% chance. If you tell me I have a 70% chance of waking up tomorrow rich, I like that. 19% I'm like, okay, it's not going to change anything. That's a one in five. We intuitively have probabilistic things running in our head all the time. So if I were to flip a coin 100 times, it's 50-50. Assuming you don't have a special coin and assuming you're not really, really skilled at flipping coins and you can do the head every time. Assuming a truly fair flip of the coin, 50-50 is approximately what we would see. But if you were to do it right now, flip a coin 100 times, you wouldn't see exactly you just see a number around 50, and if you were to do the same, and so on. And if all of us did it, probably only a few, three or four, maybe five, would actually see exactly 50 heads. A bunch of us would see 49, a bunch of us would see 51, 48 and 52 are also going to happen a lot. How many of you would see 10 heads? Maybe none. By that point, you're going 10 heads on a 50-50 chance, that's pretty low. And so we would have a distribution. So the observed difference here, 70% minus 19%, is 50% difference. So that may be real. That may have actually been, okay, that actually worked. This behavior therapy thing does have improved effects. Or it could have just happened completely by chance. Natural variation. Now, 50% is pretty big. Like 70 versus 19, those are not similar at all. And so we look at that and we say, that's plausible. It's believable that that's actually due to the one thing that was different between those two groups, which is what sort of treatment they were given and how they were taught cognitive behavior therapy. 
We will use, and the, the point of this course is to use and learn to use statistical tools for figuring out whether the difference that we see happened by chance or not. Whether it is so extreme as to say, if that happened by chance, it's like getting hit by a meteor. Or so not extreme as to say, well, that happens every day. You've shown me nothing. That's the point of this course. Are the results of this particular study generalizable to every person you know with chronic fatigue? because they weren't drawn from the pool of all chronic fatigue sufferers. They were a very specific set of people who were referred first by their primary physicians or the cons consultants, then volunteered to actually be in the study and stuck it out to the end. You can very easily in infer that maybe the people who quit were just suffering from so much chronic fatigue that they stopped coming to the appointments. In which case, you haven't helped the people with the worst symptoms at all. You have to be very, very careful in generalizing results from statistical studies. It is encouraging, though. You see it, and you say, okay, it looks like it works. The next step is to do a truly blind clinical trial where you pull from the whole population and you test this method again on a bigger population. Question? Are you actually allowed to randomly choose statistical No, no. So this is, yes. Medical ethics being what it is, properly done randomized clinical trials are often not possible because you have to put somebody in the control group where they get no help. And if you think you have a really valid result, you can't do that ethically. And this is what actually happens, and you may have read about this in the newspaper, when they run stage three clinical trials. That's run by the, the NIH in the United States. They run stage three clinical trials that's where they have people, and they're giving people medicine, and they're seeing what happens. They often call off those trials if the results are so positive on the treatment side that it's ethically irresponsible not to stop and give the medicine to the control people as well, especially in cases like cancer trials. If it's working, you stop and you give it to everybody because it could save their life, and that is the priority. We'll talk a lot, a lot about this for the whole semester. This is the focus of the course. All right, some data basics. Let's just start defining things and getting up to speed. Here is a table of data. So let's say these are the student numbers. We have 86 of them. You just kind of have to look at this and, and just tell what's going on. We have gender, and you are male or female in this. And we're assuming a binary gender distribution here, and you can run studies where you actually allow for a spectrum as well. We have a self-declared variable that determines whether you believe yourself to be an introverted or extroverted person. And we have your level of dread for statistics class. As in, how scared were you last Wednesday as class was starting? And how terrified were you by the end of the first workshop? Versus, how comfortable will you be in a few weeks? Dread. How much did you dread coming to class today? So, the columns are laid out as variables. So each of those is a variable, which then has values for the cases or observations, which are the rows. This layout is what is being, becoming called in data science, tidy data. And you should endeavor to force your observations to lie in a tidy framework, where every observation is a unique row and every variable is a unique column. It keeps your data organized. It prevents you from making mistakes, and it allows for easier analysis of the results. So what types of variables are these? So most of you have had workshop already. So you've been exposed to this idea that variables can have classes. And in statistics, variables can have types. And it's, it's the same word. It's the same thing. It's just different languages talking about the same thing. So we have all possible variables. Some of those variables are numbers, numerical variables. Some of those variables are not. Those are categorical variables. And the numerical variables can be continuous or discrete. And the categorical variables can be a special category called order. So let's talk more about each of those things. Of 
the table that we had there, where we have gender and sleep and your bedtime and the country that you're from and your level of dread. Let's go through them. Gender is clearly not a number. That automatically makes it a categorical variable. And in fact, it is just a general categorical variable. Sleep is a numerical number which represents your hours of sleep per night on average. And that is continuous because you can have decimals attached to it. Bedtime is again a categorical variable because it's not really a time, it's a range. And that's not really a number, that's an object which represents a part of a day. And it's what's called ordinal, which we'll talk about in a second. Countries are also numbers, so that's numerical, but there's no decimals now. And they are discrete, they are unique, so that's a discrete variable. And then finally, right, is categorical and ordinal, or, or also numerical. We'll talk about that in just a second. So, numerical data. They're also called quantitative. So the words qualitative and quantitative get used quite a bit in statistics. A quant, think like quantity. It's a number. And qual is like quality. It is a property. So, examples of numerical. The weight of a bunch of athletes in kilograms measured. Or the number of children in a family unit when a census is done. Living at a certain address. Those are numerical variables. Discrete and continuous options. The discrete, formally, there's a mathematical concept known as countability. And it's really beyond the scope of what we need here. But for it, for the data to be discrete, there has to be a finite, or what's called countable, set of them. Really what you can think of them as. Discrete needs to be something like the integers where they are. each happen, and you could count all of them in existence if you had an infinite amount of time. That's what countability means. So you can imagine, it's like a little kid, right? You're like, can you count to five? I'm like, one, two, three, four, five. And you're like, I can count to a million. I was like, really? Prove it. You called my bluff. Well done. But you could count to infinity. You know how to do it. You just don't want to. And you don't have enough time. That's countability. So if you could sit down and count all of the cases, then it's a discrete numerical variable. Examples, the integers, the integers are discrete. The days of the week are discrete, but they're not actually numerical. Like, you know that we have seven days of the week, and you can enumerate them, you can write them down, but they're not numbers. What number is Wednesday? I don't know. So they're not numerical, but they're discrete. So you can see that you need both. It needs to be numbers and things like the integers to be a discrete numerical. And finally machined hardware. So anybody who's ever worked in a car or any sort of um, technical thing with their hands has probably used a socket wrench. And socket wrenches come in increments of imperial metric or in millimeters for, the, for those ones. And if you have really finely machined hardware, often the tolerances for the bolts that you're using and the nuts that you're using and the measurements that you're using are done to a 32nd of an inch. Is that actually discrete? What do you think? Can you count all the 30 seconds of an inch as large as you would ever need them to be if you wanted to? Yeah, absolutely. Don't overthink it. Yes. One 30 second, two 30 second, three 30 seconds, 35 30 seconds, 36 30 seconds, and so on. And you could count infinity, or you could go 1 to 31, and then 1, and that's a member of the set. And then 1 and the 30 second. Go back to year 3, year 4, do fractions, like old school fractions, where you have a whole number and a fraction. And you can count all of those cases. So that is a discrete numerical representation of precision. Continuous, on the other hand, infinite number of possible values. And if you take uh, calculus through to third year undergraduate mathematics, you end up talking about how this works. But once you introduce decimals, arbitrary decimals, there's an infinite number of possible things you can have. And so you can't count them anymore. So basically, the way we're going to treat it in this course is if there's decimals, not fractions, not written explicitly as fractions, but decimals, that's considered to be continuous. So the weight of a newborn baby is continuous because while we would measure it as 5.246 kilograms, how much does that baby actually weigh? 
Theoretically, we could put the baby in an isolation chamber and we could measure the weight to the level of a single atom if we wanted to. But we don't because it's a baby. But it's not actually 5.246. That's an approximation. It might be 5.249376 and so on. And so we just round it off. So rounded decimals are still continuous. The probability of winning a specific lottery starts to be fractions, one in 14 million, one in 15 million, that aren't nice to work with. Those are considered to be continuous. And which atoms in your body are actually gold? Did you all take at least grade 11 chemistry at some point in your life? You know what the atomic table looks like? You know the gold is an elemental atom. So some of the atoms in your body are gold. That's just how it works. Have you ever been near something that's gold in your life? Are you wearing something that's gold at the moment? You might have a ring on, you might have earrings, you might have, you know, been touched by your mother's hand with her wedding ring on. You have been near gold, and your body has absorbed it, and you have gold atoms in you. Okay, which ones are they? I don't know. They're probably in my kidney somewhere. I don't know. So which ones they are, that's not a numerical thing. That's a categorical thing. That is a quality of your body. But the ratio of how many gold atoms are in your body to how many not gold atoms are in your body, that is a number. And in fact, it's a continuous number. So anything you come up with can be categorized this way. And I'm just trying to get you thinking about weird things you've never thought about before and how they'll fit into this framework. Have you ever thought about how much gold is in your body before? Oh, there you go. It's an interesting Tuesday. All right. Realistically, realistically, there's no such thing as continuous. Everything's actually discrete because there are a finite number of atoms in the universe. That's just a property of physics. They tell us that actually there's a finite boundary to our universe which means there's a finite amount of mass in our universe, which means you could theoretically count how many atoms are in our universe. But measuring things in atoms seems really dumb. For example, I am 1.727 trillion hydrogen atoms high. Good to know, right? <laughs> no, 5 foot 8. Why would I say it that precisely? Why would I measure my height in atoms? Then when I cut my hair, I go down a few hundred thousand atoms in height. Or, you know, I shrink a bit with age and I lose some atoms. No, you measure it in a discrete, convenient unit. Inches, five foot eight, six foot one, five foot zero. We just round things because it's more convenient. This is kind of the mantra of the course. Make it more convenient. Some things are really very clearly discrete. If an egg is laid by a hen into a nest, and you count how many eggs there are, that will be a discrete number. There will be one egg, or two eggs, or possibly three eggs. There will not be 2.7 eggs. What does that even mean? The number of medals that you win. You don't win a quarter medal. You either win, or you don't. It's very simple. You won the gold, you did not. You count them, so that really is what it comes down to. If you can count them physically, your hands, you go one, two, three, four, five. It's discrete. If you can't, it's probably continuous. All right, categorical data. This is where we're like, all right, there's a lot of data we have, which we're really ra rather interested in, but they're not numbers. What color is your hair? What color are your eyes? I'm interested in these things. I want to compute them for a population. But they're not numbers. So this is categorical data. It is also called qualitative qualities or attributional, as in an attribute that you have or the object has. And they are names or labels and represent categories. And formally, you should be able to add up the categories. The categories should be discrete for a categorical variable. So when we ask you what color your hair is naturally, we would create those categories before we start. We wouldn't allow you to say, well, I'm kind of a redhead, but I'm also kind of brown. I'm like an auburn. And you're like, that's not one of my categories. Are you a redhead or not? Check. 
You have to create the categories, you have to have a discrete number of them, and then everybody belongs to one and only one category. And obviously, if you end up with these cases where people have hair colors that are bridging between brown and black, and you don't know what to do about that, or red and blonde, and you're sort of, are you, are you sandy blonde, or well, what are you anyway? You can create other categories in between them, and that is how we get the hell that is color palette selection for paints when you're painting your house. <laughs> and there is a wall of them, and you're like, look, those are all the same blue. What is happening here? Why am I doing this? Um, if and, and when you ever have a permanent relationship with someone and you go to your house, take pity on the guys. We can't see the colors anyway. We don't care. Just pick one. Tell us what name it is, and we'll make fun of it. <laughs> all right, other examples. Social insurance numbers. They're numbers, but they're categorical because they are, and sort of, they are categorical because social insurance numbers, which every one of you should have if you ever had a job, and you're 18, so you should have one, gets assigned to one person. We don't have a social insurance number that represents everybody in the front row. It's a one-to-one. -one. It's an attribute that you have. If you strip the context, then they're discrete numerical numbers. But why would you use social insurance numbers for anything unless it was relating to the person? They're irrelevant. Otherwise, they're just weird numbers that we don't care about. But if you give me your social insurance number, first three digits tells me approximately what year you were given that social insurance number. And we can do things from it to determine ages and so on. We can also link in your tax records and your medical records and all kinds of things for medical studies. Days of the week. We talked about this one already. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Seven of them, seven labels, representing seven unique times of our cycling seven-day cycle of our human created calendar. The country of your birth. No matter your nationality, no matter if you're dual nationality or not, you were born somewhere. And so we can describe where you were born uniquely. We may not be able to describe your citizenship uniquely. Lots of people are dual citizens. You could be, you know, UK, Canada, America, Canada, pick a country here, Canada. Canada is very welcoming in that sense. But you were born somewhere unique. Your mother birthed you in a unique physical location. <laughs> Unless you were in a plane flying over a border at the exact moment of your birth, you were born in a single <laughs> country. So the subset of this that is called ordinal, the last one we're going to mention, is categorical data which can through some sort of natural ordering process that makes sense to a random person, be arranged in order. For example, the days of the week are ordinal because Monday comes before Tuesday, and Tuesday comes before Wednesday, and Wednesday comes before Thursday, and Saturday comes before Sunday, which comes before Monday, which, oh dear, we've gone in a circle. But if you choose a unique start to the week, which we've done and we've called Sunday, then they're ordered. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Done. That's the order, one to seven. Has anyone ever heard of the Likert item or the Likert scale? One, two, half a dozen. How many people are in psychology this fall? Okay, by the end of the psychology, you <coughs> should have heard of them. It is a method developed by a man named Likert, who was a psychologist. You have definitely seen these before because you've done one of those stupid quizzes on Facebook. <laughs> Do you strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, agree, or strongly agree that red is the best color and all the rest of them can go sawed off? <laughs> That's a Likert scale. He created that idea of creating discrete steps from the most extreme disagreement to the most extreme agreement. And when you fill those out, those are called Likert items, and the overall set and the scale itself is called the Likert scale. So if you do anything in psychology or uh, cognitive science, or areas of visualization in computer science, they use them all the time. All right, here's a little practice question for you to think about. What's a telephone area code? So, just commit. You don't have to say it out loud. I'm not going to ask you. I'm not going to use clickers. But just commit. What do you think it is? Is it numerical and continuous, numerical and discrete, categorical? or categorical ordinal? And the answer is two or three, depending on how you're going to use it. 
if you use telephone area codes without any context of what they actually represent, then yeah, it's a discrete numerical number because my area code is 613 for my cell phone and yours is 705 or 406 or something. Depending on where you're from, your cell phone's probably still tied to your home. So that number represents an area of geography and that number can then identify you. But the way cell phones work, it's kind of useless now because I got my phone number like 12 years ago and I just refused to get rid of it. So every time I move, I just bring it with me. So I'm still 613 because I did grad school in Kingston. And your phone number may stay the same for the next 10 years from, I don't know, Squamish, BC or something, wherever you're from. So if you use it as a category representing a geography, then it's categorical. If you just use them as a string of numbers and you wrote them down on the page and you didn't tell me what they were, yeah, they're numerical discrete, but you've stripped the context and therefore it's useless. So in the connection of the context and how you would use the data, it's a categorical. So why do we bother doing this? Why do we break this down? The reason is the type of data you have determines the type of analysis you can complete. And we don't live in the Stone Ages anymore. I'm not going to make you do statistical analyses with a pencil because we have computers and that's what they're for. So we're going to be doing our analyses on a computer. And computers are very, very picky about how they store things because in actuality, all of the sophistication of the interface of your computer is hiding a whole lot of binary code. And you don't want to be typing in your data in binary. 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. No, we, we don't think in binary. So there is abstraction layers. But at the end of the day, everything you type in gets stored as a string of zeros and ones. That's how computer hard drives work. That's how memory works. That's how computers do math. And it's all abstracted away so you don't see any of it. So because of that, computers store data in very particular ways. And that's what the first workshop hinted at and got you thinking about is the idea that you can have a variable and you can store it on a computer and it has a class, which is like a type that determines what sort of thing is stored in there, whether it's word that describes an attribute, or whether it's a number which is specifically discrete and integer, or whether it's just a regular continuous decimal number. So uh, for practice, try and match up the ones that we've talked about today with the four that we talked about during the workshop. If you've had your workshop, if you haven't, try this tomorrow after you have, and just try and match them up one to one, and then as we move forward, just keep that in mind, because when we want to go and store data in R to be able to analyze it, you store it in the appropriate variable type. All right, data collection principles. This is where we start to ramp up from just the data to the part that makes this statistics and not just science. Populations and samples. So I did promise today is a lot of definitions, and we just kind of have to burn through them. We've got to be able to talk the same language. And so today is a bunch of definitions. I strongly encourage you to take these slides and just kind of keep referring to them as we move through the first six weeks until the, the definitions click. By the final exam, you should have them all memorized. You'll know what they all are and how to use them. A population is a collection of all possible objects or persons of interest. This is not necessarily a finite population, although most of the time it is. For example, Let's say I wanted to make a strong statement about Canadians. Canadians are all polite. And you're like, well, hold on a second. I know this guy. He's like, he's really not polite. And you're like, well, on average, all Canadians are polite. And you're like, well, OK, let's figure this out. If you're making a statement like that, the thing you're making a statement about is your population. It's all of them. And theoretically, we had enough planes, and we had enough time, and we had enough toilet paper, we could get all of Canada together in a, thing of, in a city in the area of Toronto, and line us all up, and go through and be like, are you polite? Are you polite? Are you polite? And then figure out whether Canadians are polite. So the population is the set of all of the people who are Canadians. Although there's a little bit of a question there, like what does that mean? Does that mean people living in Canada who are Canadians? Citizenship, or does it mean people living in Canada, including all immigrants and visa holders and so on? 
Or does it mean everybody who holds Canadian citizenship no matter where they live? Do we need to go to Australia and steal back the few Canadians who live down there and go over to Europe and steal back the ones doing school? And well, what do we mean? So you have to be very careful. Population means everyone. And you need to carefully define it so you know what that means. If you say white rats, the favorite topic of, uh, of biomedical science, you mean the greater population of all white rats based on the genome that is common between them. They're all white, they're all rats, they all kind of are fuzzy and have little big noses. That's what it means when we say the population of white rats. So that's the population. The underlying quantity or quality that we are interested in researching, which is the property of that population, that is called a parameter. And the parameter of Canadians that we're interested in is their politeness, which you have to go, okay, do, now what does that mean? If nothing else, by the end of the semester, you're going to be confused. You're just going to be questioning everything in your life. Okay, that's fine. What does that mean? What do you mean by politeness? Let's, let's formally define this, all right? We're in science here, damn it. Politeness. It means, and then you're like, actually, I have no idea what that means. It means not being lippy to cops. It means holding doors for old ladies. I don't know. What does politeness mean? You have to carefully define this because you're doing science now. And everything has to be done very, very carefully. Or what you're doing just kind of is a mush. And this is actually the problem that has been afflicting psychology recently, is they've been having what's called a replicability crisis, which we'll talk about at the end of the semester. Sorry, at the end of the lecture, actually. I'm going to introduce it. But the problem is they've been defining things, and some of them haven't been defined closely enough. So they're actually a little fuzzy. And so the results don't hold up when you actually start to look at them really closely. So you have to be really, really careful, especially in the social and psychological sciences, to really carefully define what you mean and what you're trying to study as your parameter. Now, a sample is a subset of that whole population. You're like, all right, I want Canadian politeness, but I don't want to fly 36 million people to Toronto and line them all up and ask them if they're polite. So, why don't I just ask you? That's a sample. Maybe not a good sample, but it's a sample. It's a subset of the whole population. You all qualify under my lives in Canada version of what Canadian means. And if I went through and I talked to all of you and I figured out how polite you were on some kind of scale that I have not yet made up, that would be called the statistic. And that's where our field gets its name. Statistics are observed quantities or qualities of a sample. And the field, the study of statistics, is the study of those sampled parameters. So, a sample is to a population as a statistic is to a parameter. And our goal with this course is to use inferential statistics, which is the same as inference. If you've done any math, it's the same concept. It's basically reasoning from logical assumptions. It's saying, given what we know, what can we determine? So that's inference. It's the, it's the act of trying to make decisions on the basis of known knowledge. So here's an example, uh, population in a sample. So the uh, question is, uh, if you wanted to become a better, more efficient runner, and efficiency in running is about your stride and your heel-toe pattern, essentially how much energy you use to do each step of your run, can you just go out and do a lot of running if you just go out and you start running two hours a day, will you eventually get efficient at it? Or will you just keep flailing for the rest of your life? You know, Forrest Gump to the end. So population of interest is everybody. We're actually interested in whether everybody could become an efficient runner if they just tried. Our sample is going to be from this article in the New York Times. Everything that I use that comes from somewhere will always have a citation in the bottom of the slide if you want to follow it up, to, especially when I start referring to papers like I did in that psychology one. If you're in that field, go grab the paper. Skim through it. You won't understand all of it, but it's good to expose yourself to the actual research literature early and often. It's actually a sample of a group of adult women who recently joined a running group. And the population to which the results can be generalized is that everyone? Well, no. First off, they're women. Not women and men. They're adults. No, 
with children or teenagers. And there's other problems which we'll keep talking about. So if the data were randomly sampled, in other words, if we went through the country and we picked 30 adult women at complete random from all of the adult women, and we had them join the running group, then the results from whatever they determined could probably be generalized to all of the adult women that they were drawn from. But because they self-selected, they joined that running group of their own volition, the results are generalizable to adult women who want to join a running group, which is a whole lot smaller than adult <coughs> women. You have to be very careful with your sampling, and that's, that's this topic right now. So let's talk about some anecdotal evidence. Um, how many of you either have smoked or have a family member who does smoke to this day? Okay, we're sitting about 30%, maybe 20% now. That number has dropped by about half or more in the last 10 years. It used to be everybody smoked. It was just kind of the thing. And this was especially popular in the 1920s and 1930s and 1940s, where essentially it was just socially everybody smoked everywhere. You'd smoke in the home, you'd smoke in the bars, you'd smoke in the restaurants, everywhere smoked. And in the 30s and 40s, when it actually like full took off after World War I and then especially after World War II, uh, and everybody was smoking, they started wondering, is this good for us? Like, Intuitively, taking tar and tobacco and ingesting it into your lungs doesn't seem great, but like it doesn't actually have adverse health effects, or is it just kind of okay and whatever? So, the problem with this was that people would resist. They'd say, Well, I have this uncle, let me tell you, and he smokes three packs a day, he has since he was a teenager, he's healthy as a horse. And you're like, Okay, that's nice, that's a piece of evidence, maybe. My uncle's not that way. The problem is, when you use anecdotes like that, something that you know from your own personal life or that you've read, that's a single data point. And on its own, <coughs> it means bupkis. You can't use single data points to conclude anything. So, it's not representative, too. Maybe that guy just has the most amazing constitution you've ever seen, and his cells resist cancer like you wouldn't believe, and the reason he never got lung cancer is that his body's constantly fighting it off, despite smoking three packs a day. So, in the end, it was concluded at the time that smoking is a complex human behavior by its nature difficult to study, confounded by humans which is a weasel-worded scientific way of saying, eh? I don't know. Question? So, anecdotal evidence is not reliable? When I'm not in the least. And part of this class is trying to slowly train your mind out of its intuitive step, which is to take one personal thing that happened to you and make it the center point of your reasoning. If you've been hit by lightning, you're likely to think getting hit by lightning is actually far more common than it actually is. If you've had something good happen to you, your brain tries to attach causality to that. It says, oh, I had a really good day because I got up and I got Starbucks. So Starbucks must make my day great. So I should get Starbucks. And you're like, you just had a good day. And it just so happened that you started with sugar. Okay, good for you. But that doesn't prove anything. So you have to train yourself as part of being a scientist out of the intuitive human step of attaching importance to incidental, unimportant, single points. Perception bias. <laughs> so, uh, in time, so once we got past the 40s, and once we got computers, and once modern medicine kicked in, and once some lawsuits finally shook loose the data that people needed, and once we got past the massive wave of insane amount of money that advertisers were throwing at the issue, scientists were actually able to finally study this, and they concluded that, in fact, yeah, you smoke for your whole life, you're probably going to die of emphysema or lung cancer. That's just life. That's what it does to you. But we needed an entire lifetime, 60 plus years of people smoking, for some of these effects to become clear. It's not like you puff on one cigarette, your lungs explode, and you die of cancer the next day. It's not quite that immediate. And so subtle effects take longer to expose and take correspondingly larger and larger populations of study samples in order to determine the true effect. 
Anybody familiar with the Higgs boson? Yeah, a few people have heard of it. What about the Central uh, European Observatory that does giant smashing of atoms into atoms? CERN? Has anybody heard of CERN? Okay. CERN completed a five-year project a few years back trying to find the Higgs boson, the so-called God particle. In the end, they had somewhere on the ballpark of 17 petabytes of data, repeated experiments, before they were willing to say conclusively that they had actually observed it, and that they had found it, and that it was not just noise. Because they were looking for something very, very small, very, very precise, and very, very hard to find. Medical science has mostly picked off the low-hanging fruit at this point. The stuff that's really obvious, like, yeah, you should wash your hands before delivering a baby. Or, you should not smoke, because it'll probably fuck up your lungs. <laughs> or, heroin's going to do weird things to your brain. <laughs> those kind of things, we're kind of past that now. We know those things. That's just common stuff. We tell everybody, like, eat your vegetables, because it'll make you big and strong. Yeah, vegetables are good for you. They have complex, you know, carbon things. <laughs> I don't know. I never looked into it. Oh, yes, eat your vegetables. But in terms of medicine, they have hit a wall now in the last few years where they've discovered all the easy stuff. And they're now in the world of physics where everything is prolonged and hard and tricky and you get little tiny steps of progress. And that's what's making everything so hard is that we actually have to show things conclusively before you're going to tell an entire population that you need to do this thing better for you. For example, uh, you're just old enough that probably in your childhood, do you remember the, you may not remember the explosion, but your whole childhood, no polyunsaturated the fats and how things were unsaturated fats or saturated fats and how bad fats and good fats. It has recently been discovered that most of that is bunk and means nothing and was the result of studies funded by the sugar lobby in the 70s. And then in fact, mostly, fats are good and bad for you in moderation, just like everything. And there's no like, get rid of all the fats in your diet and you'll be healthy, and that doesn't actually work. And there's no get rid of all the sugars in your diet and that'll actually work. It's mostly just everything's bad for you and will eventually kill you. It's just a question of how fast. So everything in science, we have to be very skeptical. We have to be very careful because we need strong evidence to truly conclude things that generalize to total populations. So, uh, when it comes to smoking, you could say, well, why don't we just take every single smoker in the world? Right? We could do that. We could just go around, like bringing all the Canadians to Toronto and asking them about politeness. We could just go around and be like, so you've been smoking. How long have you been smoking? Okay, so how much do you smoke? All right, and um, health effects. Have you observed any problems with your lungs? Um, do you have cancer yet? Um, and so on. And we could, we could have done an enumeration of every single member of the population. You can do this. It's called a census. And it's expensive. And it takes a lot of time. And you don't ever quite get there because there's always that one person who's often Borneo when you want to ask them well, about their smoking habits. So the problems with a census is that they're hard to complete, they take a lot of money, and it actually ends up being very complex. The process of taking a census it's usually a process started by the national stats agencies three to five years before they actually do the census, gearing up and getting ready to actually do it. But we run them once in a while because the data is fully reliable, no questions asked. Although I will say, even with census in Canada, when we do our full-blown, not Stephen Harper destroyed, actual census, which we did two years ago, only one in five actually completes the full blown census. The other four in five complete the summarized version. And that is useful and nationally done in most of the Western countries. The UK runs a five year census. Canada runs a every five year census. The US runs a 10 year census. Australia runs a five year census and so on. And they are extremely valuable tools. And if you're in the social sciences of any sort, most of the time when you're dealing with data, it comes from those censuses.
That's where the data comes from that you use for your studies of demographic and social change over time. So here's a problem, just to sort of show you where in the US they run into the issue. Um, there was a 2010 census, and they're coming up to the 2020 census for the Americans. And Phoenix, which is an area in Arizona, which has a very high Hispanic population, was underrepresenting the Hispanic population because a lot of the people who live in Phoenix weren't filling out the census because they were worried that if they completed the count, that would expose them to immigration raids and they'd be deported. So Phoenix undercounted their Hispanic population, which means they didn't know how many they really had, which means they didn't know how many services they need and where to put schools and all these things. When you're doing a census, it's absolutely important you actually make sure it's a complete census. Otherwise, you might as well just not even do it. And this, I was ranting on Harper just a minute ago, this was the problem with the 2011 census in Canada. Stephen Harper's government changed the census to make it voluntary, which immediately meant that it became an underreported census, and there were entire communities, especially rural communities in the prairies, where there were so few data points that the data was worthless and had to be thrown out. And that's a problem because that data is used to determine fire coverage, police coverage, where the schools go, how many spots the universities are gonna need in 18 years because they know how many kids there are in the regions. All those things get determined on the basis of demographic data from these censuses. So if you're gonna do it, do it right. And that was the, for statisticians, we're, we're all nerds, okay? But that was the coolest thing about the incoming liberal government in 2016, was they took power in November, walked over to StatsCan, gave them a blank check and said, make it right. And they pulled the plans off the shelf for the 2011 that they had to scrap when it was canceled properly and just rolled it out. And it was so successful that they crashed the servers because so all the people were trying to fill it out too fast. So that's the kind of thing that you need to do when you're doing a census. All right, how do we work with this? So um, inference, we want to do inference, we want to take data, we want to use that to conclude things about our problem. Exploratory analysis is exactly what it sounds like. You are exploring your data in an effort to understand it and to then make conclusions about it. So think about it like cooking. You may not cook, but you've seen people cook. You've watched the cooking channel when you were bored. I know you have. So you have a soup. The soup is on the stove. It is simmering away. It smells delicious. And you're like, is it done? I want to taste it. And you taste it. That's great. But have you stirred that soup lately? Are you tasting just the top? Or have you stirred it and it is a well-mixed soup? so that you know that the salt balance is right, and oh, maybe you need a little more salt. But if you just take the top, and then you add more salt, and the salt goes to the bottom, and you do it again, and you do it again. Eventually, the bottom of your soup is very salty and not very good soup. And the point of the soup is to eat it. So when you are doing exploratory analysis, the spoonful that you are tasting from your soup needs to represent the whole soup. You don't just want a little bit of soup. You don't want to grab just a piece, just one bean off the top of the soup and ignore the rest of it. You want a mouthful that well represents the entire soup. When we are doing statistics, the sample that we are exploring and using for our determination, like our spoonful of soup, needs to represent the whole population. So just like you'd stir the soup before you taste it, the sample needs to be taken from everywhere. And the way that we do this is to sample in a very specific way that we're about to talk about. So uh, you asked questions about bias. So here's, some, here's a few of the biases that can happen. Then we'll talk about methods of sampling. So non-response bias, if you randomly sample people but only a few of them give back to you, that can be a bias because you actually didn't get enough information back from your sample. Maybe the people who didn't respond are the ones who actually are the ones you wanted to hear from. Yeah, be careful with that. Voluntary response, this was the problem in 2011. Usually, when the sample consists of people who volunteer to respond because they have strong opinions about the matter, you end up getting a bias because you're actually hearing from the people who have already split themselves into two camps on the issue, and you're not getting the people in the middle who just don't care. And then a convenient sample, uh, this is just that individuals who are easily accessible are more likely. So if I'm likely to ask you something about yourself and you are in these front two rows, you are my convenient sample because you're right here and I can point to you. And I'm not pointing back there, and you're like, well, do, do we meet? Mm -hmm. Whereas you know that I'm talking to you. So convenience sample is just where you grab from somebody who's convenient. Doesn't mean it well represents the type of person who sits in the front row is actually a little resistant 
to the pressures of being picked on by the prof. That's why you sit in the front row. You're willing to put up with that, and you sit here because you want to see the screen mom. So be careful with that. Here's an example of one of these things. You've all done these. This is not a scientific poll on Facebook. So do you get paid sick days? You're like, yes, no, what job? And then it comes back, yes, you get paid sick days. Who's the type of person who's likely to fill this out? Someone who's either already at home or who is on a paid sick day. What about people who don't, who are at work sick right now? So it's a convenient sample because it doesn't well sample the population and it's going to get people who volunteer and that's not really reliable data. So you're talking about like, like you, the volunteer response isn't like reliable, so like how can you force every single person to take the whatever it is that it is? You can. And most of the statistics is about dealing with that very fact. So censuses have the advantage of law. You fill out the census or you get fined and possibly go to prison. So that's why people complete them. And that's why censuses are so valuable is because they are one of the very few things where we get mandatory reporting and you don't have a choice about answering. Also, your tax return. Kind of mandatory. Don't do that? Yeah, they'll throw you in prison for tax evasion. So everybody fills it out. Even if you made no money, you send it in. And you guys will get money back. It's really nice being a student. You do, you, whenever you work in the summer, that money comes back. It's a really nice check in March. So. But you fill out your tax returns, which means tax returns are a reliable source of data because everybody, or almost everybody, fills them out. And medical records. At least in Canada, because we have one medical system in Ontario, everybody belongs to OHIP. And everybody is in OHIP, which means the records there represent pretty much everything you've had done to you. I mean, if you're rich, yeah, maybe you go get your heart transplant done over in India or something, and you pay an Indian surgeon to do it for you. But realistically, in Canada, almost all of your health records are in one spot, which means it's not a convenience or a voluntary problem. So you're right, though. You're absolutely right. When you're doing a survey, you're trying to find out information, getting good information is hard, genuinely hard. And if nothing else, I want you to take away from this course that it's tricky and you need to be careful. Here is a historical example for you just to show how bad this can get. So this is America, again, 1936. So this was the middle of the Great Depression. Alf Landon was the Republican presidential nominee. That's him on the left. He was opposing the re-election of FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who was the incumbent Democratic president. The Literary Digest, which was a magazine at the time, uh, did a poll. They polled about 10 million Americans, which is a quite, quite a number back in 1936, and they got responses from 2.4, and the poll showed that Landon was going to be the overwhelming winner. FDR would only get about 43% of the popular vote and would be crushed in the popular election. Election result, FDR kicked his ass. 62%, the most lopsided electoral college victory in American history. What happened? How did they do a poll with 2.4 million people and end up with a result that was so wrong that the magazine went bankrupt and went out of business soon after. So what happened? Well, the biases we just talked about. Who did the magazine survey? 10 million Americans, but which 10 million? The people who subscribed to the magazine, people who owned an automobile, and people who owned a telephone. This is 1936, the middle of the Great Depression, the most horrific economic disaster ever to strike America. There were a whole lot of people who were still registered to vote, who didn't have a telephone, and didn't have an automobile, and didn't have money to waste on a literary digest magazine. <laughs> Those people voted. And that group of people is essentially upper middle class. So they surveyed the upper middle class who voted for the Republican. When you survey the country via the actual national election, they did it. <coughs> so they did not obtain a representative sample of America. And that resulted in the problem. That sample was huge. 2.4 million is far larger than any poll that's done today except for censuses. But it was a biased sample to start with, which means the result they got was only generalizable sample 
population, which meant upper middle class Americans. So yeah, upper middle class Americans voted for Alf Landon. Good for them. Middle class and lower middle class said, no, we're voting for FDR. And he crushed it in the election. So. What happened with Trump? You're asking why Trump is president of the United States right now? <laughs> I ask myself that every day. Not from the polling point of view? Yeah. Here's the thing. The polls that were the most accurate were actually correct. Hillary Clinton won the popular election by 2.5%. She had 3.7 million more votes in the popular election than Trump did. And she won the popular election in a lot of states. But in three states in particular that have been poorly sampled, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan, Trump won the election there by less than 50,000 votes per state. It was 50-50 in those states. And most of the polls showed it was 50-50 in those states, but kept giving bias toward Hillary Clinton based on the political leanings of the people either doing the poll or writing it up. And if you go back there, and if you're curious about this, I do encourage you to read about this kind of stuff. There is, uh, are you familiar with 538? There's a website called 538.com. It's a political and sports website that does statistics. They're all about statistics in these areas. They were doing these polls and aggregating these polls. And they have a retrospective talking about what, what went right and what went wrong. The margin of error, which we're going to talk about uh, next class, which is how accurate they were, had enough flexibility, the election result landed right in that margin of error. It was just a little bit more toward Trump than they had anticipated, which was enough to flip three states which was enough to send the Electoral College to the Republicans, which was enough to elect his orangeness. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's a practice question for you to, to think about. So, a school district is considering whether it will no longer allow high school students to park after two recent accidents where high school students got injured because high school students are stupid. <laughs> so, as a first step, they surveyed the parents of the high school students by mail asking whether or not they would object to this change. They send out 6,000 surveys, much bigger high school than I went to. 1,200 of these surveys are returned. Of the 1,200, 960 agreed with eliminating parking for students at school, and 240 disagreed. Which of the following of the four statements are actually true about this problem? Some of the mailings may have never reached the parents. The school district has strong support from the parents to move forward with the policy approval. It is possible that the majority of the parents of the high school students disagree with the policy change. And number four, the survey results are unlikely to be biased because it was actually a quasi-census. It was mailed to all of the parents, not just some of them. So what do you think? Which one of those four, or which of those four, more than one is possible, are actually true? So just make a decision. It's totally fine. I'm going to show you in just a sec. But just commit. Go, okay, I think it's uh, one and two, or one and three, or three and four. So just, just commit to it. There are two correct, I'll tell you that. Two true statements there. They are? One and three. Of course, some of them didn't make to the parents. Maybe they got thrown out with the junk mail. Maybe the child who parks side and threw in the garbage. Maybe you. Who knows what happened? It never reaches everybody. Of course, that's true. And it is possible that a majority disagree because only one in five of the parents actually responded. The other four thousand eight hundred parents are not included in this result. So you cannot generalize to all of them unless it were truly a random sample. Because who's most likely to respond to this thing? The ones that want the thing passed. The ones that want the kids not driving. Maybe because they're tired of their child taking their minivan every day and they just want their car back. Who knows? But the parents disagree. It is entirely possible that the other 4,800 don't feel the same way. It's not a representative sample. So, to identify a pair of variables when you're doing a study like this, what we say 
is that we identify which one we think influences or affects the other. Now this is our suspicion. We don't know this for sure. We can't guarantee this. So you have an explanatory variable and a response variable. You choose the labels. And then the arrow that is between them is a maybe. All right. It's not a guarantee. It's not for sure. It doesn't happen all the time. It's a maybe. So it does not guarantee that the relationship is causal. Now, I've used that word a couple of times, and I haven't defined it. So when I say something is causal, I'm referring to causality or causation, which means that A causes B. So for example, my explanatory variable is that every morning at 5.43 a.m., the rooster in my backyard goes cuck a doo My response variable is that the sun comes up. So clearly the roosters cause the sun to come up, so we should worship the roosters and all hail the rooster. Let's worship the roosters. <laughs> uh, yes. Right? My logic is false. Find a flaw with it. Cause and effect were switched in that. And when you're doing science, you don't actually know it's like th there's a statement in literature that says, kill your darlings. And it's referring to the editing process and how you have to take the passage you love the most. And that's probably the worst section of the entire paper. And you should just scrap that, that section. It's called killing your darlings. It's actually your darling. You love it. Kill them. So when you're doing a study, you have to kill your darlings. You have to question your assumptions and what your gut says, because your gut's probably wrong. Maybe not, but you need to set yourself up to disprove it. You don't ever want to be confirming your suspicions in a way that just makes it all roll and you're, in, you're intuitively biased toward the result. I like roosters, and so therefore the rooster is clearly God. No. The rooster crows because he knows the dawn is coming. It's the other way around. But doesn't everyone have their own cognitive biases? Like, yes. we understand Yes. So, like, how It's difficult. I didn't promise it was easy. Uh, but the process of science is trying to create an alter ego within yourself who attempts to be 100% unbiased and who just takes everything as a question and everything as a skepticism. You have to be a skeptic to be a scientist. Otherwise, you end up just confirming your own biases over and over again. You're not doing science. You're not helping anything. There are two types of things that we will study through the year. The first is called an observational study which is where we collect data that in a way that has no influence whatsoever upon how the data arise, happen, or whatever, even how they are reported most of the time, we simply observe. There are a whole lot of studies, in fact, the majority of studies that are this way. Because just observing something doesn't require ethics approval. So we can do it. Whereas experiments, we take subjects and we act on them. We actually do something to them. And we randomly assign them to various treatments, including a control. And then we examine the outcome. So if you want ethics approval for that, it's like three times harder. Because you have to say what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and you need to guarantee that no one's going to be harmed in any way, including tiny boo-boos on their finger, by what you're going to do. And if you don't, you don't get ethics approval, and then you are sad. <laughs> Observational and experiment. About a third of your current homework is just asking you to read things and go, which one that is. And you just have to think about it. Did the scientists act on the subjects? If all they did is record the results, it's an observational study. And that's going to be retrospective. You can look back in time and do an observational study. So just revisiting correlation versus causation. I love XKCD. It's an online webcomic that's done three times a week. It's super nerdy and often very funny. And I check it every, three, every, every couple of days. This is a comic from it. And all he does is stick figures. It's what he's done for like a decade. He just does stick figures, but it's the words that matter. I used to think correlation and loss causation, then I took a statistics class, and now I don't. So it helped. Well, maybe. Basically, <laughs> what I'm aiming for at the end of this course is for you to be more confused about the world. 
but to know that you're more confused about the world. To know that you actually understand less, that you know where your biases are, and that you understand that most of what we do as humans is actually just quadrants. You have to think about things in a very skeptical way, and it's hard. It really is hard. So, correlation does not imply causation. Just because two things changed at the same time doesn't mean one caused the other. The rooster crowed, the sun came up, the rooster did not cause the sun to come up. Okay? There is a website called Spurious Correlations from a man named Tyler Vegan. He's actually written a book on this. It's actually hilarious. You just go to it. It's basically just trend lines of things changing. For example, margarine sales in America and things like that. And he has things where they change just like at the same time. And some of them are like ludicrous, like the number of shark attacks off the coast of, the coast of Florida and the current president. <laughs> like, you know, Republicans cause more shark attacks. News at 11, right? Like, it's all silly stuff like that. And some of them are actually really hilarious. It's worth poking at if you're bored over lunch, just to kind of laugh at how silly some of them is and reinforce the idea. Just because two things change at the same time doesn't mean they caused each other. All right, sampling strategies. And this will, yeah, we still got lots of time. So here's a study for you. And we are going to try and intersperse a lot of real world studies here, because you can see how these are done. This is uh, an article from the Associated Press, the AP, a new study sponsored by General Mills. Girls who regularly ate breakfast, particularly breakfast, including cereals, are slower than those who skipped the morning meal from this study that tracks 2,400 girls longitudinally over 10 years. So if you don't eat breakfast, uh, clearly you're going to be uh, heavier and way more than someone who eats General Mills cereal every morning. <laughs> so this is the logic of it, and this is the whole thing, and not eating the breakfast is the worst thing you can do. That's the takeaway. It's from the Maryland Institute of the... Uh, Medical, Maryland Medical Research Institute and cereal and fiber and so on. What kind of study is this? Observational or experimental? Did the researchers at the Maryland Institute do anything to the girls? They didn't divide them into categories. They didn't ask them to do anything. They just asked them, what did you have for breakfast? That's observation. They observed, they didn't interfere. So it's an observational study. They observed the behavior. What was the conclusion? There is an association between girls eating breakfast, including that which has fiber in it, and being thinner. Who sponsored the study? This is the skepticism coming out. Who paid for this? A cereal manufacturer. Oh, isn't that cute? Right. Skepticism goes up to nine right now. As soon as you see who funded it, you're like, oh, the sugar lobby paid for that. Right, okay. Take it with a pound of salt. Not a grain, but a pound. General Mills paying for this? I automatically suspect that the results are not as strong as they're saying. Here are the three possible explanations for what happened. Yeah, eat breakfast, especially General Mills, and you get thinner. Everybody just start eating lots of General Mills cereal, and we'll all get thinner. It'll be great. Who doesn't want to lose five pounds? Number two, being thin causes girls to eat breakfast, especially cereal. So the thinner you are, the hungrier you are, and therefore the more you want to have breakfast. Causality flipped. Number three, there's something else going on. This is probably the explanation. This is called a confounding, and often referred to online or in other resources as lurking. So you should write that down. Variable. There's something else going on that is relating the two that is connecting the two. There are thinner girls. There are girls who eat breakfast. And there is something else going on that makes those who eat breakfast tend to be thinner. Maybe it's that more athletes are in the eat breakfast side and therefore they are burning off more calories than the breakfast costs and therefore they're thinner. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's that people who don't eat breakfast tend to have a more fluctuating gut ecosystem and therefore are more tempted to snack because they're hungrier later. Who knows what it is? But the eating of the breakfast itself is definitely not the causal effect. We don't have proof of that. 
And unless you do a true randomized experiment, you cannot ever say that. Because could because it was um, it was sponsored by General Mills, could they have like picked certain people, like certain girls? They could have. My understanding is that actually the study was randomly selected, so they did find people and ask, and that part was done right. Okay. But the issue here is not even so much of what was found in the actual study. It's the things like not eating breakfast is the worst thing you can do. They are taking an association where people who eat breakfast tend to be thinner on average than people who don't, which applies to teenage girls, not to everybody, but to teenage girls. And they are generalizing and saying, not eating breakfast will cause you to die. <laughs> no, what are you saying? They are overgeneralizing, and they are assigning a causality where it does not exist. Um, could there be cases where you can't find a sponsor for that study? Like, no, well, I can't remember what you open up and you like, if you drink alcohol, you'd be like, something much prettier. Right? Yeah, in the last decade, I have seen Coffee causes cancer, coffee prevents cancer, coffee causes cancer, coffee prevents cancer. C coffee causes this, coffee prevents this. Chocolate's good for you, you know it's bad for you. You know it's good for you, you know it's bad for you. Wine, back and forth. The problem with all of these studies is that, yes, you're right. Half the time, they're funded by the side that wants it to be good for you. You don't even know. If you learn by the end of the semester to take everything you read in the news and try and trace it back, I would be ecstatic. Because you're right, what we get in the news is a hyper-sensationalized, biased, overly generalized version of the action of research. And universities are just as responsible for this as the news, because most big research universities have a PR office. And they take research, like what I do, and they're like, just a bird, cures cancer. No, I didn't. What are you saying? So when you read something in the news, usually they give you just enough information that if you're good at Google, you can actually go back and at least find the original press release that they based it on. And then once you have the press release, you can usually find the paper. And the paper will say something very carefully worded like, there was an association between these two, but causality would require a, a, a forthcoming study. And then they take it and they're like, General Mills cereal will make you thin. You know, this, this strange trick that you never thought of. It's clickbait, right? So. Be very careful when reading studies. So another couple of words for you, just definitions. When you do a prospective study, it's pro, you identify individuals, you connect with them, you gather the information. So the, NELS, the nurse's health study is a very, very long running uh, <laughs> longitudinal study using questionnaires of practicing nurses. And what they do is they identify nurses who are just graduating from nursing school. They contact them and they ask them if they're willing to be part of the study. And then they try and follow up with them regularly and they get them to fill this out over time. So it's actually been really, really helpful because they're a group of healthcare professionals. They understand the healthcare system. They tend to be reasonably healthy people. And it's given them a great database over time to see how people's health changes when they're in physically demanding jobs. Because nursing is a very physically demanding job. If you don't believe that, you should try being a nurse because it's brutal. So, that has, that's a prospective study. They identify them, they recruit them, and then they study them. A retrospective study is what we do most of the time because we didn't have the foresight to be born in 1950, so we could start a study in 1976, so we could have data to do our master's thesis. So we just go on the internet and we find data, and then we analyze it. That's a retrospective, going back in time, looking back, taking data that was gathered, and trying to figure out how to use it. So retrospective and prospective studies. So. This ties into the final idea. This is how do we go about obtaining good samples? Because we want a sample from the population that is representative. We want our soup to be well mixed. So how do we do that? It's all reliant upon randomness. We want there to be no structure to the way that we selected it. When you take a big spoon and you stir your soup, you're not going, come on, salt, come here, come here, salt, come to the middle. You're just stirring it and mixing it, and stochastic things happen, and it all just mixes together, and then it's delicious. When we take a population of people or rats or who knows what, and we select our samples from that population, we do so in a way that ensures that we randomly select. 
There are a few other random sampling techniques, but the three that we are concerned about in this class are simple, stratified, and clustered. This is simple random sampling. You've got a population, and you just completely randomly select the people for your sample. So if we were to do that today, I would not start pointing at people. I'm really bad at selecting randomly. I'm intuitively going to be biased toward my right, because I'm a righty. So I would select more people from here than from over there. And I'm intuitively biased to people whose faces I can see, so I'm more likely to get from the front half of the room. You don't trust yourself to do it. You have the computer do it, and you do it randomly. So simple random sampling is just that. Take the whole population, and with pure randomness, select a subset of that population, and then ask them your question. Are you bored? So take n subjects. Select them in such a way that every single member of the population has exactly the same chance of being selected. So there are about 260 of you. So we want your probability of being selected to be 1 over 260, just like the backwards hat guy in the background. And you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you. And so we would take your student numbers, and we'd put them in a computer, not in a spinny thing with a lottery, but in a computer, and we'd randomly pick one of the 260. And then we'd select another, and another, and another. You need that randomness. Humans are really bad at producing random numbers. Here's an example. Take a moment. Don't think about this too much. Pick a number from 1 to 20. OK. How many people picked 1? That's a solid 0. How many people should have picked one? 13. There are 260 of us, and if we all picked 1 to 20 completely at random, we should have had 260 divided by 20 people, which is 13 of us should have picked one. How many people picked seven? About 10, so that's about where it should be. 20. Only four. It should have been 13. We were really bad at this. Don't trust yourself. Don't assume, oh, I can make this random. No, no, you can't. You're bad at randomness. You're human. We intuitively shy away from edges and toward middles. So picking a random number from 1 to 20, you go, oh, I don't want to pick 1, because that's really easy to guess, because you're always playing a game with your siblings or something. Except that 1, apparently, nobody picked it. So it would have been a great number to be on, because they would never guess. So we're really bad at this. Don't trust yourself. Other methods are stratified, systematic, and cluster sampling. We're not going to talk exactly about how these work just yet. When we need them for studies, we're going to reintroduce them as we move through this semester. So for now, simple random sampling is it. That's the only method you know how to do, which is just pick completely at random. So more errors for you, more biases. A sampling error occurs when only part of the population is measured. This is what happened with the Alf Landon FDR election. They sampling errored because they surveyed only the affluent members of society, so they only were able to determine what the affluent members of society wanted, which was for the Republican to get in. If they'd surveyed everybody, they would have had a better shot. Non-sampling errors are biases which result from the sample that you get not being a good spoonful of soup. Not representative of the actual population. Those biases and those errors cannot be measured after the fact. If you have them, you won't know about them, but they're probably going to blow up your study. So you have to be careful in stage one and make sure that your prospective population is sampled from randomly. Here are some other errors which can occur. So we have non-response, which is where people just don't write in. That's like the survey of the parents about the parking. Self-selection bias, that's the sick days example. Framing bias, this is where we start to get into the cognitive science and the psychology of it. How you ask the question can often change the way people think about it. We'll talk more about that as we get deeper into the semester. And this was the problem um, with Brexit. You're all familiar with Brexit, vaguely at least. The UK held a national poll, national referendum, on whether they should leave the European Union. 
except it wasn't a mandatory referendum, not everybody completed it. And the question was so convoluted that a lot of people voted the wrong way by mistake. Framing is that bias. The way you write the question will lead your reader or your surveyor toward the answer that you want. And you can be really tricksy with this, and that's what a lot of, um, what is it, PR agencies and companies that make advertising actually do. Question wording, so how you word the question. The order of the questions, you can, there's this thing called priming in psychology, where you can sort of prime people toward a certain output. So there's a lot of things. We posted quite a detailed PDF on Blackboard. If you're curious about this, check it out. It's actually really fascinating. Okay, I have about five minutes left according to that clock. Yep, I have five minutes left. Let's quickly talk about how experiments work and we'll wrap up for the day. In studies where researchers assign a treatment to a case, the subject, those are called experiments. So I need to act. If I'm not assigning things or doing things to the subjects, it's not an experiment, it's an observational study. If we assign the treatments randomly, then it's called a randomized experiment. These have a series of four principles. Stick it out, guys. We only get two hours a week. I'm going to use all hour and 50 minutes, okay? Researchers assign treatments to cases and control. So control is our word for principle one. We try and control for differences. So in a drug trial, you might say, okay, we're going to give a pill to people. And all the people on this side of the room are going to be given the placebo. And all of you are going to be given the actual drug. The amount of water you take it with could influence the results. It could change the way your stomach acids act and the way that you take up the drug. So to control for the fact that some people might just toss a dry pill in their mouth and swallow, some people need a whole lot of water, some people take it with a shot of whiskey, you know, all kinds of things. To control for that, researchers will say, please take a single glass of water, 12 ounces, filled with water, take the pill, drink the water. Everybody's then the same. That's a control. Principle two, randomization. We have to randomize. We can't just say all of you are placebo and all of you are the pill because that's not random. And maybe you sit on the left-hand side of the room for a reason. Maybe you sit on the right-hand side of the room for a reason. We need to randomize. So we need to use the computer and randomize the assignments so that it's you, you, and you are all in one group and so on. Number three, replication. The more cases you have, the better your results get. Furthermore, the gold standard for this is, I run the study, and then Joe Schmo in Milwaukee does the exact same study with a completely different set of patients and a completely different team. That's a full-blown experimental replication. And if I do that, and then he does that, and we get the same results, it's that much stronger. Because it means I didn't do something or have some special characteristic of Canadians that influenced the results. And number four is blocking. So you may know before you start that something else may be, in fact, influencing the result you're looking for. So what you do is you take that other thing that you think might influence it. And in medical trials, this is often gender. Women and men react to drugs in quite different ways at times. So we know that. So rather than just randomly select you, ignoring gender, we block you. We move all of the women to one side of the room, all of the men to the other side of the room. Then we randomly assign women 50-50 and randomly assign men 50-50. But we've blocked them ahead of time so that we can see what happens just to the women and what happens just to the men and then what happens to the whole group. That's called blocking. So here's one practice question, and we'll wrap up here, and I'll do the next few slides uh, next week. So we have a study designed to test the effect of light and noise on your exam performance. So the researcher believes that they might have different effects on men and women, so wants to make sure that both genders are equally represented in each of the two groups. So. Which is true. Are there three explanatory variables, light, noise, and gender, and one response? Two explanatory, one blocking, and one response. One explanatory, three response. Two blocking, one explanatory, and one response. So from what we've said so far, the response is definitely unique, and it is your exam performance. The blocking is unique, and that is the gender, because the researcher wants to divide. 
So we have one blocking and one response, and the only answer that matches that is number two. All right, we have five slides left.